Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Ethan Allen Homestead. My name is John Devineau. I'm one of the board members here, and uh, this is the talk that we had scheduled for last week, and due to the weather and Robert being under the weather, uh, we decided to go for today, and it looks like it was a wise choice all the way around. Robert's talk is Green Mountain Firepower, 1777 versus 1861, and if you look at the displays on the table, you see there's quite a bit of firepower in the room. Uh, at this time. Rob is an award-winning author of 15 books on American military history. He received a Master of Arts in American History from Rhode Island College. He's a former National Park Ranger. Uh, Robert is now an analyst for the federal government and he resides in Jericho, I believe, with his wife Elizabeth, daughter Addison, and another daughter to be born in early June named <laughs> TBA. <laughs> we would like to, before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors for today's talk, Vermont Federal Credit Union, 802 Cars, and One Day in July Financial Advisors for their generous support to the homestead. And we also want to thank Channel 17 Town Meeting for being here to broadcast, to uh, record this. And if you have friends who are not here and they use a computer, they can get on the computer, they can watch the talk at any time. Uh, when, when we get the schedule out, it'll be also put on channel 17 and we'll send that out to everyone who has an email address along with the link that they can, you can watch it at your pleasure. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to Robert. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. Hope, uh, hope everybody's uh, doing well. Thank you uh, so much for coming out uh, today. It's uh, great to be here. So. Uh, talk today is going to be about the weapons that were used by the Green Mountain Boys that fought in the American Revolution and the Green Mountain Boys that left Vermont to go and fight in the Civil War. And during both of these conflicts, the technology that came out of them in weaponry, the, the soldiers' personal weapons, is amazing. You start out in the Revolutionary War almost right up through the Civil War with uh, soldiers using flintlock muskets. And then by the time the Civil War ends in 1865, troop, a lot of troops are using you know, what we today would consider modern, rimless, repeating weapons. So in that 80-something year span, American weapons come out and develop immensely. And this is a bit of a modification of a talk that I used to give uh, back in college, I was a park ranger at Harper's Ferry National Park, and uh, a lot of uh, this uh, arms development happened uh, down there at Harper's Ferry. But we'll start out with uh, the Green Mountain Boys that fought in the American Revolution in 1775 to 1783. So the French and Indian War ends 1763. The British have come in. They've booted the French out of Canada, conquered Montreal and Quebec. Settlers start moving into what's the Hampshire Grants, living in the Champlain Valley, and they bring with them different firearms. Now, in the military, right up and through the early 1900s, when you left the service, you, you were either given or you had the option of purchasing the weapon that you used in the military at the time, and that ended shortly after the Spanish-American War. So a lot of these soldiers discharged from the military at the end of the French and Indian, or what we call the Seven Years' War, moved into the Champlain Valley with the weapons that they had been issued with them. And a lot of these soldiers fighting with what were called the provincial forces in the French and Indian War are going to be armed with brown bass muskets. Now. The origin of the name Brown Bass, I, I looked this up online and I could find about a dozen different things. So if, if you want to know about the origin of the name Brown Bass, go Google it. That's another lecture for another time. But this was the standard issue British military firearm from the 1720s right up through the 1830s. And it comes in at various times. There's four main varieties of musket. They progressively get shorter over time, but this right here is what's called the long land pattern musket. 
And the British, uh, they have the sea pattern and the land pattern. This is what is issued to the British Army. Uh, entirely manufactured over in England, all handmade. This is the primary weapon that's going to be in the hands of Americans fighting for the crown in the French and Indian War. And it's also that going to be the weapon that is used by British soldiers in the French and Indian War, the Revolutionary War, in the War of 1812. Matter of fact, Mexican soldiers storming the walls of the Alamo are going to be armed with brown bass muskets that they had purchased surplus from the British. So these things have quite a long shelf life and American soldiers have even brought relic guns similar to this back home from Afghanistan in the War on Terror today. So a lot of the veterans that are from the French and Indian War that move into the Champlain Valley are going to be armed with these. And when the American Revolution kicks off in 1775, this is going to be the primary weapon of a lot of those American forces early on. And American Committees of Safety, which are pretty much uh, government-run organizations that are created to arm and equip local militia units, they're going to take this weapon and they're going to Americanize it. They're going to uh, basically strip it, strip it down to the bare minimum, and a lot of these are going to be manufactured in the colonies and used by American forces. So, 75 caliber, pretty much the standard weapon of the era during the American Revolution, and especially for American forces early on. Uh, when Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys storm into Fort Ticonderoga, in May of 1775, they're going to be armed with these. They're going to be armed with Charleville muskets that they had captured during the French and Indian War from the French. Uh, they're going to be armed with all sorts of things. Uh, if you've ever been to Fort Ticonderoga, you've probably seen uh, the weapon that Ethan Allen gave to Benedict Arnold. He gave him a blunderbuss. So there's really no standard issue for these soldiers. And a lot of times these men would have to manufacture their own cartridges, they have to make their own musket balls, there's really no standardization. So you can have some men armed with uh, 69 caliber weapons, some armed with uh, 75 caliber such as this. There's a huge mishmash of guns that they are using early on in the American Revolution. By 1777, however, things start to change. The French have come in on the American side, and the French begin shipping over large quantities of Charleville muskets. Uh, very similar and very different uh, to the brown bass. Um, both are flintlock, uh, the ignition system used back here. But the, Ameri the French weapons are, instead of the British weapon, you notice the barrel is pinned to the stock, it's very difficult to remove. The French designed weapons have these barrel bands, very easy to pop off, very easy to take the weapon apart. So large quantities of these start arriving in Portsmouth Harbor in 1777. And Portsmouth is pretty close to what's called the Northern Department of the Continental Line. So most American troops by September and October of 1777, when they're going into action against Burgoyne's men at Saratoga, most American Continentals are going to be armed with Charleville pattern muskets. So the standard American caliber during the war becomes the 69 caliber down from 75. But 75 caliber is a large chunk of lead. It's three, three quarters of an inch. And these weapons are smooth bores. Ulysses S. Grant wrote in his memoirs of his experiences during the Mexican War when they're primarily still using flintlock smoothbore muskets. And he wrote that the two sides could stand apart from each other 150 yards and not hit the broad side of a barn all day. Uh, these, these guns pretty much have an effective range of at most 100 yards. 
if you want to actually engage in combat, most of that is happening at between 50 and 75 yards. The standard British uh, tactic of the time is to get in close, fire a volley, and charge with the bayonet. Uh, Americans uh, put a lot more emphasis on target practice. Even though the Americans are still standing in line shoulder to shoulder, you'll notice in the, uh, in the British drill manual of the time, the British command is to present, which is pretty much to point this in the general direction of the enemy. The von Steuben tactics that the Americans adopt uh, later in the Revolutionary War is to take aim. And you'll constantly read in accounts they were told to aim low, to aim below a soldier's waist, because these things do rise up quite a bit as they're fired. As I mentioned, these are flintlocks. These are very temperamental weapons. Uh, you can imagine weather like we have outside today, uh, kind of misty, kind of drizzly. You get any moisture in the pan of this weapon, it's pretty much going to make it into a 12-pound club. Um, becomes, once these things get followed up, they require cleaning, they require constant uh, maintenance. Uh, while these weapons you know, are mass-produced, uh, issued out to uh, soldiers who really don't have much of an education uh, in terms of being able to read or write, uh, they did require uh, maintenance. They weren't something that you could, um, for example, take uh, like an AK-47, put it in mud, pick it up a week later, and it'll still work. Uh, these things are quite temperamental. So the Americans go to war with these, the British go to war with these, and they fight each other, and the Americans win, and they win not because these were effective on the battlefield. They're more of an instrument to inflict casualties, to create chaos, one side breaking, and eventually the Americans are able to win out because of their supplies, because they are closer to their home bases. So to load this, it's a very complex uh, procedure. You know, today uh, we have weapons, you just load them up and they shoot themselves. This required a soldier to learn certain steps. And these steps were repeated continuously on the drill field practice time and again. Uh, von Steuben during the Valley Forge winter in 1777 into 78, he's out there in all sorts of weather training with the Continentals teaching them how to load their weapons, and that was done throughout the American Revolution. And the British come over to the colonies with a trained army, well-disciplined. It takes the Americans a few years to catch up. But by the Battle of Monmouth in June of 1778, the American army is really on par with the British. So, to load this, we first have to create our, our ignition source. This is a flintlock. We need powder to make it go bang. So you would put the weapon on half cock. If you notice, uh, there's uh, several cartridge boxes around. And this is what the soldier would keep his uh, powder in. And while at the start of the American Revolution, a lot of soldiers carried uh, powder horns filled uh, with gunpowder, uh, bullets in their pouches, uh, as the war went on, a lot of them were carrying uh, cartridge boxes of various manufacture. Uh, the French supplying a lot of them as well. So you'd put the weapon on the half cock. You'd take a cartridge out of your cartridge box. You'd bite it. And you'd put some powder in this little pan back here. And then once the powder was in the pan, you'd shut the pan, basically this is like flint and steel. This is like a, a, a lighter that you would have uh, even today. And flint and steel create a spark. Inside the pan is a little touch hole. Spark would go through the touch hole, ignite the main powder charge, and shoot the weapon. So after you've primed the musket, you take what's left of the cartridge, and the powder and ball, and you're gonna put the whole thing down the barrel. Again, these things are smooth bores. And 
basically it's, if you can imagine, it's just a pipe. It's just a smooth pipe that you're putting down powder and ball. So adding that cartridge down to that gives you a little bit more room for resistance for the ball to travel. Seat the ball, and then you have to ram it down. You have to seat the ball all the way down to the breech. When you hear that noise, you can tell the weapon is uh, clear, by the way. So you'd seat the, seat the ball all the way down to the breech of the weapon. And then, very, very important, you return the rammer. <laughs> you know, it... Well, I, you if you can imagine, if you're standing there, might just be tempted, just stick the ramrod right in the ground. Well, what if you're told you have to advance over there? You literally have just disarmed yourself. This is very important. So you would put it back. During the Battle of Spotsylvania in May of 1864, there was a New York uh, major from 49th New York. He actually was uh, shot in the chest with a ramrod fired by a Confederate who had left it in there. Um, it will it will travel a good distance if you leave it in there. So you've you've returned your ramrod, your weapon is all set, ready to go. Make ready. You bring the weapon back, put it on the full cock, present, and fire. You saw the the spark created that would go into the pan, ignite the little powder charge into the barrel, boom. Now, the drill manuals of the time, this is both the Civil War and the Revolutionary War. The drill manuals of the time say that a good soldier can fire three aim shots in a minute. I believe that's hogwash. That's three aimed shots a minute on the drill field. I want you to imagine for a moment 18th and 19th century combat. You're marching into action shoulder to shoulder in two ranks. Marching onto the battlefield, you're met by enemy cannon fire raining in, shelling you as you advance. You close up n near the enemy, and this is when chaos starts. Imagine the officers and sergeants in back of you walking up and down the line, screaming at the top of the, their lungs to load and fire. You're trying to go through all of those steps. Tear the cartridge, prime the pan, shut the pan, charge the cartridge, ram it, return the rammer. The enemy is shooting at you. You have musket balls coming in. Around you, your friends are being killed and wounded. You're listening to the calls of the drummers beating out drum commands. At the same time, you're trying to maneuver. The commanders are trying to maneuver the regiments, the companies, as best as they can. The black powder smoke, the white sulfuric smoke, you're breathing that in. It's obscuring the battlefield. Tell me if you can fire three shots in a minute while all that's going on. I highly, highly doubt it. So, soldiers would do their best to maintain command, to respond to orders, but oftentimes they would only fire three or four rounds in action during the Revolutionary War. It would often come down to the bayonet. Whatever side could maneuver first to deliver a bayonet charge, and time and again, the British do that. The British are masters with the bayonet. You know, we, we, we learned in high school growing up that a bunch of guys in red coats came over here, bungled their way through the woods, and got defeated by Americans fighting behind trees and behind uh, bushes. That's complete hogwash. The British adapt to the tactics that North America requires. Uh, you see that with Burgoyne's army fighting in New York. You see that with Howe's army fighting in Philadelphia. Uh, Cornwallis fighting in North Carolina and Virginia. The British adapt time and again to the circumstances. Why do they lose the Revolutionary War? Basically their supply line is 3,000 miles away. Every bullet, every gun, every bayonet, everything the British are using is coming from England. Everything the Americans are using 
is coming here or the French are sending it. So without that French aid, it would have been a close call for the Americans. But a combination of the British supply line coming from overseas and French supplied weapons makes the American Revolution the miracle that it is for the Americans to win. So the Revolutionary War ends, 1783. The Green Mountain Boys, uh, Warner's Continental Regiment, they've used whatever they can find on the frontier. Uh, Battle of uh, Bennington that they play a large role in. A captured German surgeon who was there basically said the Americans were using everything from squirrel guns to blunderbusses to military muskets. They show up at Bennington and fight with whatever they have. And that's pretty much what is maintained on the frontier during the war. You have to remember Warner's regiment is raised to guard Vermont, guard the frontier, as it is during the time. A lot of these weapons, the Charlevilles, are going to the Continental Troops, the main army that's fighting the British. So the Revolutionary War ends, and a lot, just like at the end of the French and Indian War, a lot of those Americans are able to take the weapons that they had been issued, either buy them or given them, and bring them home. So we start our, uh, our, our new country, the United States of America. And George Washington comes in as the first president and he realizes that the United States better prepare itself for where one might come down the road. And <clears throat> as president in 1794, he creates two federal armories and an arsenal system. There is either one or several arsenals that will be built in every state. In Vermont, that arsenal, the Champlain Arsenal, is going to be in Virgins. And under this system, <clears throat> the United States will maintain a very small professional army that will primarily be responsible for guarding the frontier, going out west. The main American force will be just like in the Revolution, militia. The federal government, however, will make those weapons, send them to the state arsenals so that if something happens, the governor can call the state militia, go to the federal arsenal, and issue those weapons to the state militia. So arsenals to be built in every state or several in the state, depending on the size, Two federal armories will be built, one at Springfield, Massachusetts, one at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. It's now West Virginia, but it was uh, Virginia until 1863. So that's the idea, 1794. <clears throat> so we, we start this federal armory and arsenal system, 1794, building weapons. But what type of weapon are we going to build? What is going to be the American weapon because we cannot if we go to war again in this country we cannot be reliant on foreign weapons like we did from Holland from Spain from France during the American Revolution so in 1795 the Americans adopt their first weapon the pattern 1795 musket and they don't copy the brown bess they pretty much make an Americanized version of the Charleville and the basic idea, the basic shape, design of this will be reflective in American military weapons right up through the 1860s. So 1795, the, the pattern 1795 is adopted, and that's the weapon that is going to be used by American forces during the War of 1812. Uh, the 1795 is uh, supplemented in 1816 with a new pattern uh, flintlock musket but pretty much the same uh, basic design and those guns will be used right up through the Civil War so this system works very well weapons are manufactured at Harper's Ferry they manufactured at Springfield sent to the small professional US Army out on the frontier and sent to various state arsenals to be delivered to the militia. 
So while this is going on, primarily Harpers Ferry, Springfield, they're making flintlock uh, muskets. And they'll do that up and through the 1840s. But a lot of design, a lot of technology is going to go into what will come into the Civil War. So they're very content making these weapons, but there's a lot of different ideas in the history of firearms that are going on. A lot of developments, a lot of testing going on at both Harpers Ferry and Springfield. So in 1811, there is a guy named John Hall. And John Hall is a native of Portland, Maine. And he has this idea for a breech-loading rifle. Now, as I mentioned, these are muzzle loaders. You load them from the muzzle. One shot, one at a time, ramming it down. Hall has the idea of a breech loader. You load it from the breech. It's also a rifle. A rifle means that there's grooves in the barrel, creates a spin. So while these weapons have an accurate range of 75 to 100 yards, theoretically Hall's rifle can reach out to 300 yards. Now during the American Revolution, there were riflemen on all sides. The British had them, the Germans had them, the Americans had them. However, rifles during the American Revolution are very difficult to load. Uh, this is an example uh, here. You know, something like this, while that might, you might get off two to three rounds a minute with that, this is going to take you a good minute to a minute and a half to load each shot. You have to carefully measure the powder charge. You have to uh, carefully seat the ball. A lot more complicated. Uh, Washington, both George Washington, both loved and hated riflemen. He thought that they were really good to go out and engage the British at long range to skirmish with them. But when they got up close, this thing doesn't take a bayonet. Uh, this thing's very difficult to uh, load. Look how flimsy the stock is. I wouldn't want to hit a guy in the face with this. It would break. So these things are not really good for that type of warfare. Would a sharpshooter use something like that? Uh, that's later on in the Civil War. We'll get to that because there's a sharps rifle over there. So John Hall has this idea. Let's create a breech-loading rifle. The U.S. Army says in 1815, wow, that's a great idea. Why don't you build us 100 of them? and we will uh, send them out to the field to test. So, breech-loading rifle, they had existed during the American Revolution. You might have heard of the Ferguson breech-loading rifle used by the British. So, John Hall gets a contract to make these weapons for the U.S. Armory. However, you have to remember, all guns manufactured up until this point are all made by hand. These things literally are works of art. Um, you would have somebody who would concentrate just on making a barrel, somebody who would make a part of the lock. You became very good at that. However, if one of these guns breaks while you're out in the field, every single part is individually made. So you can't really take a piece off of another gun and add it to another gun. Oftentimes, these damaged weapons would have to be sent back to an arsenal, to be rebuilt takes time, a lot of money. So John Hall misses his contract with the US Army because he cannot build these weapons in time. However, he comes up with an, another idea, and this is what gets him on the map. I feel John Hall is right up there with John Moses Browning as probably the uh, most genius of American gunsmiths because his idea in 1819 is Okay, breech-loading rifle, sounds great. Why don't we make these things by machine? So that every if a part breaks on this gun, I can just go to a box, pull off another part, put it on, and it'll still work. So he goes to Harper's Ferry and creates a rifle work. And he designs machines 
that pretty much make every piece of the rifle. And his idea is interchangeability. Uh, Eli Whitney had, had worked on it, but it's really John Hall at Harper's Ferry that perfects this. And his idea of this is taken to Congress. And he brings 10 of his rifles to the House of Representatives. And he strips them out into their various pieces, puts them in a pile, and then invites the representatives to come onto the floor and put them together from these very pieces. He stripped down 10 rifles, he gets 10 rifles, and you know what, they all work. Genius move because Congress authorizes him to create a rifle factory at Harper's Ferry to supplement the federal work going on. In addition to that, Congress also decides that Harper's Ferry and Springfield will start making interchangeable parts. And you can learn more about this down at the American Precision Museum down in Windsor, Vermont. A lot of those machines are actually manufactured there. But now, gunsmithing, rather than being an art, you quite literally could have English, Irish, German immigrants come over here and just be taught how to run a machine. So it really changes the whole uh, culture, especially at uh, Harper's Ferry. Another story for another time. So by the 1830s and 40s, American weapons are being made by machine. They're interchangeable, so much so that you can take a gun that was made in Springfield, combine it with parts that are made at Harper's Ferry, and it's going to work. And what about John Hall's rifle that really makes this all possible? The U.S. Army, the, the, the guy sitting in, in an office building in Washington, love Hall's rifle. They think it's the greatest thing ever. The uh, guy out in uh, Nebraska or uh, the Dakotas, they absolutely hate these things. The Hall's rifle is a piece of junk in the opinion of most soldiers serving in the field. The early machine parts that Hall makes at Harper's Ferry, they don't really have the tolerances that later interchangeable parts will have. The breech on these guns was very weak. It fit in very loose together, so much so that it was responsible for catching soldiers' beards on fire. It would blow up. Eventually, enough powder would um, cake up in the breech of the gun, and it would explode. So soldiers in the field absolutely hate Hall's rifle. But again, that idea of interchangeability. Uh, the British adopt it uh, in the 1840s, and it really is taken all over the world. And uh, again, a lot of those machines are made right here in Vermont in the Precision Valley. So that's one of two developments going on as we, as we go into the Civil War. The second is taking place in France. And for almost 200 years, the round ball had been the standard issue uh, weapon, smoothbore. You know, again, rifles, great idea, but you're not going to mass issue rifles to every soldier. Uh, they, they're very complicated. They take a while to load. And you don't really have the range. So soldiers are still, even, even into the Mexican War, are still f fighting, standing there with flintlock weapons 75, 100 yards apart. So in France, in the 1840s, we have a guy named Claude Manet. Manet is a captain in the French Army in the Ordnance Department, and he starts tinkering around. And he comes up with a pretty brilliant idea. Well, we're going to have a rifle, but instead of loading that rifle with a round ball, we're going to go with a conical ball, something very similar to, a, uh, to what you might think of when you think of a modern bullet. But Manet's design is that the ball, and he still calls it a ball, is slightly smaller than the diameter of the rifle. If you notice on the bottom, it's hollow. The idea is 
that it's going to, the bullet will be lubed with some type of grease. It's going to be loaded into the, into the rifle. And so when the rifle is fired, hot gas will enter the bottom of the projectile. These grooves will cause it to grip into the rifling and will cause the projectile to spin. So basically you're loading the weapon with a slightly undercaliber ball. Uh, for example, um, the Civil War weapons are 58 caliber. The projectile is .575 caliber. So slightly smaller than 58 caliber, but quick enough to load. And now you're getting that increased range. So Manet's idea, first adopted by the French, later by the Austrians. Well, the Americans catch on to it in the early 1850s. And there's another guy down at Harper's Ferry named James Burton. Uh, Burton is a master gunsmith at Harper's Ferry. He's a civilian. But um, he does a lot of work with Manet's design. But he Americanizes it. Uh, Manet's design incorporated a wooden cup in the base of the projectile. Uh, Burton's like, we don't need that. Let's add an extra groove to it. Let's put grease inside of those grooves. So Burton really does the work on this. Uh, we call it the, the mini ball uh, in the parlance of today, but what's used during the Civil War is really should be called the Burton ball because it's James Burton, who's the master armorer at Harper's Ferry that really uh, puts this design together. So Burton, Burton tinkers with uh, Manet's design. Uh, he initially, uh, builds a weapon, a projectile in 69 caliber. 69 caliber had been the American uh, caliber of choice going back to the Revolutionary War. However, a 69 caliber rifle, this has a lot of recoil. He starts tinkering around with different ballistics, different ideas, and he comes up with a 58 caliber projectile. And he tests it, he perfects it, and in 1855, the U.S. Army adopts the 58 caliber rifle musket as its standard issue. In addition to that, in 1842, the U.S. Army had swept over to the percussion system. Now, remember what I said about uh, the weapons of the... Uh, French and Indian War right up through the Mexican War. They're flintlocks. And they're very temperamental, very uh, difficult to load in uh, rainy weather, even when it's uh, misty out. 1842, the U.S. Army officially adopts the percussion system. So now, you have at the back of the gun, it's very much the same idea like a kid's cap gun that you might, might have played with uh, as a kid. So you put on this uh, small cone here, a small brass projectile. It almost looks like a top hat. And it's filled inside with gunpowder and fulminate of mercury. So that when the hammer hits that, it sends an explosion down this cone into the barrel. And that could be fired in all sorts of weather. And that's what the U.S. Army adopts in 1842 in the pattern 1842 musket, which is still a 69 caliber smoothbore, but uh, with um, percussion. So 1855, the U.S. Army is going to adopt a rifle musket. Now, keep this in mind. The U.S. Army adopts this weapon in 1855. They only use it until about late 1866, when it's phased out and it's replaced by what eventually becomes the trap door uh, system. About 11 years. More American fighting men are going to be killed or wounded by this weapon system than anything else in our nation's history. This gun right here kills more Americans than anything else that's ever been invented because of the Civil War. American fighting American. 
Burton's design is brilliant. Burton's projectile is amazing. During, again, during the Mexican War, Ulysses S. Grant wrote that you could stand 150 yards apart and not even shoot at each other all day long. Now, with his projectile, you can reach out to five to 600 yards. It increases the killing potential exponentially. Those round balls, however, when they hit a target, they really didn't deform. They, they spun, they hit the target, and it was very easy for a doctor to go in, remove it with a, a pair of, of long pliers that he might have in his box. <clears throat> this projectile is made out of soft lead. When it hits a person, it's going to mushroom. So there are two examples of fired bullets. Uh, this one you can see literally mushroomed in on itself, and look how deformed this one is. When these hit somebody, the amount of damage they do is unimaginable. If you get hit in an arm and a leg, and we often think of uh, Civil War doctors as being sawbones. They like to amputate because they like to amputate. Amputation was about the only medically available thing and training they could do at the time. If this hits a bone, it's going to shatter the bone. The only thing the doctors of the period could have done was amputate an arm or a leg. If this projectile hits you in the head or the center mass, it's pretty much over. Um, these create massive trauma wounds. Slow moving lead projectile. Also keep in mind, doctors at the time did not know germ theory. Uh, they're operating in very primitive uh, field hospital conditions. They're not washing instruments between patients. So if you survived to make it to a hospital, more often than not, the secondary infection that might set in is just as deadly as these, as these weapons. The Civil War is really the apex of the muzzle loader. We've taken this technology and we've expanded it into now a gun that can kill at five and 600 yards. And when we look at Civil War casualties, 53,000 men over the course of three days at Gettysburg, 30,000 in two days at Chickamauga, 24,000 one day at Antietam. Even today it blows your mind. And most Civil War soldiers are going to be killed or wounded by weapons like this. Now, you might ask, why are those casualties so heavy? Well, these guns can kill at five and 600 yards. That is true. Keep in mind, however, the drill manuals did not catch up to the technology. You have soldiers fighting the Civil War, literally using the same, with, with some variation, the same drill manuals that they are used to fight the American Revolution with. You still have men marching into battle, shoulder to shoulder, fighting with these weapons. And yes, even though they have that advanced range to reach out and hit the enemy, the tactics of the time say that you still get in close. Uh, Patty Griffin, in his book on Civil War tactics, wrote that the average Civil War engagement happened at about 125 yards. So it's almost a football field apart. Also, you have to remember the culture of the time. The Civil War regiments, particularly the companies that form these regiments, are recruited in the same community. Uh, Company F of the 13th Vermont, so out of my town of uh, Jericho and Richmond, Company I of the 6th Vermont is recruited in Williston and Essex. You get the idea. Men come from the same communities. 
So quite literally, when you're marching into battle, the man on one side of you could be your brother, your father could be standing in back of you. All around you are people you've known your entire life. The culture of the time was such that it was better to die on the battlefield than to show the white feather. Because if you broke and ran to the rear, everybody back home would know about it. Imagine having to go back to Jericho and show your face that you broke and ran while your neighbors stood there and died. So that, the combination of the culture of the time and also the unchanging of the tactics leads to this weapon being so deadly in the hands of American soldiers on both sides. In 1861, when the Civil War starts, these uh, Springfield and Harper's Ferry had been making these weapons for a few years. The Harper's Ferry arsenal is blown up by United States Army forces at the start of the Civil War to prevent the guns from falling into Confederate hands. However, the young West Pointer who was stationed at Harper's Ferry, his name is Roger Jones. He had only been out in the Army about a year. He doesn't have enough gunpowder to blow up both the rifle works and the arsenal with the completed weapons. So he decides to blow up the arsenal building with about 19,000 finished weapons in them. He doesn't have enough gunpowder to blow up the rifle works. So the Confederates show up in town, they take over the rifle factory, and they send all that machinery down to Richmond, Virginia, and Fayetteville, North Carolina. So during the war, a lot of that machinery that had been captured at Harper's Ferry is going to be used to make nearly 100,000 weapons for the Confederacy. Springfield, they continue business like usual. By the summer of 1864, they're turning out 1,000 of these a day. That's not enough, though, to keep the Union forces supplied. So nearly 17 different manufacturers are going to be employed to make these. This particular weapon right here was made in Providence, Rhode Island by the Providence Tool Company in 1864. Prior to the Civil War, the Providence Tool Company uh, manufactured pipes. Uh, they made fence work. Uh, they even made handcuffs believe it or not. During the Civil War, they start making these. Um, you had arms manufacturers, if you've ever gone down Route 93 in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, those huge factory buildings near the Merrimack River. That was the Amoskeeg uh, Manufacturing Company. Amoskeeg makes weapons. They're, made, they're manufactured throughout the North. Nearly a million and a half of these Model 1861 Springfield pattern muskets are going to be made for Union forces during the war. Standard issue weapon, and this is the type of firearm that's going to be responsible for killing or wounding more Americans than anything else in our nation's military history. The Vermonters are going to be issued these weapons throughout the Civil War. Uh, when the Vermont troops initially go to war, a lot of them are going to be armed with Enfield pattern rifle muskets, which are very similar to these. They're going to be made in uh, various factories in London and Birmingham over in England. By the spring of 1864, however, the Vermonters, like most Union forces, are going to be armed with some variant of the uh, Springfield. The Civil War is really the zenith of muzzle-loading technology. Um, you know, there's been a lot of debate during the, the war and afterwards that Union forces, they had access to breech loaders, they had access to more advanced technology. But those old generals, the same people who thought that John Hall's rifle was this brilliant new thing, they're like, we don't want those newfangled guns you know, you got to remember, Civil War soldiers march just about everywhere. So, if you have a gun that's firing seven or eight shots a minute, you're going to go through a lot of ammo really, really quickly. So, soldiers marching everywhere, they would carry 40 to 80 rounds of ammunition on them, and that could be resupplied over time. 
But if you have men going through large amounts of ordnance every day, that's going to create a severe supply problem. So the Civil War is really the last era of the muzzle loader. It's the last time that these guns are going to be used, the last war where men line up shoulder to shoulder and fight each other. But there's, there's changing technology, and we have to rewind the clock a little bit back to the 1850s. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> remember what I said about John Hall and his rifle. The idea of breech loaders had always been around in the American military. And John Hall's rifle and a carbine version of it, a, a carbine being a smaller rifle, it's adopted in 1819, and they're issued to the U.S. Cavalry right up through the Mexican War. Soldiers hated the gun, but if you're issued it, you carry it until you can find a replacement or just get rid of it. So, breech loaders had been around, but it's going to take some time for a new design to come up. <coughs> Excuse me. So you have various people throughout the 1840s, the 1850s, tinkering with various designs. <clears throat> Christian Sharps is probably the most famous of these. Uh, his design of a breech loader um, really goes into effect in the late 1840s, 1850s. He's really uh, working on that design, improving it continuously. But Sharp's rifle, say, uh, well, there's one right here. That's helpful. So Sharp's, his idea is a breech loader, and you load it from the breech by dropping down the breech block, put a paper cartridge in there containing the, the bullet, the powder goes in there. This is almost like a, uh, a cutting device. It cuts the back of the cartridge off, and you put a percussion cap on the cone, and uh, the weapon is ready to fire. But he, Christian Sharps is still using paper cartridges. You have to remember, if you're a, uh, if you're a cavalry trooper out there on the frontier, you have something like this, and these really didn't change much between the Revolutionary War right up through the Civil War. Leather cartridge box. Imagine you're, uh, you're out in Texas uh, chasing after some Comanches, and uh, it's a downpour, and this gets wet with all of your paper cartridges. Well, gunpowder, when, when it gets wet, gets pretty slimy. You're not going to be able to use that. You need something waterproof. So, in the 1850s, there is a young lieutenant named Ambrose Burnside. And Burnside was a West Pointer, class of 1847. He saw a little action in Mexico right at the tail end of the war. And in 1851, Burnside is a lieutenant stationed in Las Vegas. And he's assigned to go out and scout on the Navajo territory. And he goes and finds the Navajo and gets into a little fight with them, and he ends up taking an arrow wound. His men, even though the Hall's carbine had been issued to American cavalrymen, Burnside is an artilleryman, and his artillerymen are riding around on horseback with muzzle-loading rifles. Imagine trying to load one of those on horseback. Uh, the army needed additional men, so it's like, Okay, you have horses, go find the Navajo. So they get into a really nasty fight with the Navajo. Burnside is wounded, but he has an idea. Let's create a better to use carbine that you can load on horseback, but also somehow waterproof the ammunition so that you can use it in any type of weather. His idea takes fruit. He resigns from the army in 1853. He's married. He moves to Rhode Island and sets up a rifle factory in Bristol. And what Burnside comes up with is absolutely brilliant. 
he creates the first metallic cartridge to be used in an American military weapon. Now you have the projectile and the powder all in one system, and it's waterproof. Now keep in mind, he, he does not invent a rimfire cartridge that does, you still have to manually put a percussion cap on the cone to fire it. But now, this is waterproof. I could, I could fall from my horse into a river, get out, and my ammunition's still dry. To fire this, he creates his own rifle, the Burnside breech-loading carbine, 54 caliber, and these guns go through five or six different um, phases. Uh, this particular one is a fifth model, Burnside. It was manufactured in February of 1864, and it's in the serial range that was issued to the 1st New Jersey Cavalry during the Civil War. Uh, whether it saw action, I don't know. I will add that um, the previous two weapons that I uh, showed, they don't have serial numbers. Uh, American military rifles really don't get serial numbers until 1873, but a lot of these uh, privately uh, manufactured weapons, like the Sharps, like the Burnside, they do have serial numbers, so you can trace them uh, to some degree based on a lot number. Anyway, so Burnside designs a weapon that you can quickly load on horseback. Pull down the breech, so our cartridge is gonna go in that little hole there. Close the breech up. Remember, as I mentioned, you saw to manually prime the weapon. It's not a self-contained cartridge. That really won't come around until 1862 with Christian, um, excuse me, uh, Spencer and uh, his system. So still manually primed, but again, a waterproof cartridge. So now we have a gun that is really something. And Burnside starts turning these out. He thinks he's invented a wonder weapon. And the US Army tests this gun. The officers in the field, they're like, we'll take anything over the Hall's rifle. So they really like this. However, the contract goes to Sharps in 18. 56 Sharps carbines are the weapon that is decided to arm the cavalry uh, in the pre-war U.S. Army. Burnside, he's broke. He's put up his own money to manufacture these. He goes out of business. The Civil War comes a few years later, and Burnside uh, joins the Rhode Island uh, forces, eventually becomes a general. Um, some people don't like him. I love him as a native Rhode Islander. Uh, even though he's from Indiana originally, he, there's a huge statue of him in Providence. We're proud to claim him as our own. So it's called the Burnside Rifle. You think Burnside ever made a nickel off of these things? No. He sold, he sold the patterns. He sold the gun factory. So when the Civil War comes in and thousands of these are being manufactured, they just carry the name Burnside, but Burnside never saw any money from this. Uh, this is actually the third most issued uh, carbine of the Civil War. The Vermont connection to these guns is beyond interesting. So during the Civil War, uh, Vermont, Vermont over the course of the Civil War raises uh, 17 regiments of infantry, a heavy artillery regiment, three companies of sharpshooters, three companies of light artillery, and one cavalry unit. First Vermont Cavalry is recruited from all corners of the state. Uh, George Armstrong Custer considered it one of the best in the Union Army, but his opinion really doesn't count after what he does, you know, out west. Wasn't too smart, you know, when you graduate bottom of your class at West Point, you know. So Custer loves the first Vermont Cavalry. But when the cavalry troopers leave Vermont, in uh, late 1861, they're going to be armed primarily with swords such as this. They're also going to be armed with a mishmash of pistols. I've, 
I've read somewhere of at least two or three different types of revolvers being issued to this regiment. So various weapons. So, you know, a sword and a pistol is really good if you're on horseback fighting against other cavalrymen. But American cavalry tactics of the time pretty much made cavalry almost like mounted infantry. You'd ride into battle, dismount from your horse, and fight on foot with a carbine like a Burnside or a Sharps, and then mount up again and maneuver around like that. Um, you might have seen what uh, John Buford did at the first day of Gettysburg with about 2,000 cavalry troopers. He held off 30,000 Confederates for four hours until the rest of the Union Army could get up into position. So that's what cavalry is designed to do. They're designed to go out and scout ahead of the enemy. The first Vermont cavalry loses more men in little hit and run battles against the Confederates than they do in big open engagements. So if you're fighting on horse against another guy on a horse, those are up close weapons. So the first Vermont cavalry goes to war. They don't have any carbines. Uh, there's not enough carbines in the U.S. Army arsenal at the time to outfit every regiment with. So the 1st Vermont goes down to Virginia. They do their thing, mostly fighting in the Shenandoah Valley. They're at Gettysburg. They're pretty much everywhere in the Eastern Theater during the war. But they don't have these carbines. And uh, Custer uses them in 63 and 64 you know, really as a mounted regiment where they're engaged in cavalry uh, action up close. But where the Burnside comes in is quite fascinating because if you were a soldier back then and if you were uh, injured, wounded in action, if you were sick, you'd be sent primarily to a hospital in Baltimore, uh, Washington area, sometimes even New York City. There were hospitals uh, throughout the North. There were actually three big hospitals uh, right here in Vermont, in Montpelier, Brattleboro, and Burlington. Um, in Lakeview Cemetery down the road, there's actually a soldier's plot where uh, soldiers who died at, that, at the hospital are buried. And so when you would be sent to one of these hospitals, you would normally turn in all of your ordnance. You wouldn't normally take your uh, pistol, your sword, whatever with you to the hospital. You'd turn it in, and there'd be no guarantee that you would get the same gun back when you came back to the Army. So the, these Vermont cavalrymen start going to the hospitals, start getting sick, start getting wounded. They're turning in their swords and pistols and going to the hospital. Well, as they recover from their wounds, from their illness, they go to the quartermaster to get rearmed, re-equipped to go back into the field. Well, the quartermasters would pretty much give them whatever equipment they had lying around. So it's like, oh, you're a cavalryman? Here's a Burnside carbine. Go have fun. Oh, you're going back to the 1st Vermont? Here's a Sharps carbine. In April of 1864, the 1st Vermont Cavalry is using Sharps carbines, Burnside carbines, and Spencer carbines. All of these carbines came into the regiment from guys being sent back from the hospitals. And you can imagine the logistical nightmare for the regimental quartermaster trying to supply three different types of ammunition, because none of the ammunition on these carbines is interchangeable. You could have a Springfield and an Enfield rifle musket, the two primary infantry weapons of the Civil War. They both used 58 caliber conical balls. You cannot fit the ammunition from the burn side in anything else. It's proprietary to the burn side. So the Vermonters go to war in 1864 into the Shenandoah Valley armed with an absolute mishmash of guns. But they use them pretty well, especially at Cedar Creek, where they capture nearly 20 Confederate cannons and over 1,000 prisoners in uh, Jubal Early's flight up the Shenandoah Valley. So from 1775 to 1865, you know, that 90-year span, the technology changed rapidly. You start out in the period using smoothbore, flintlock muskets, and you, as you transition over to the Civil War, you go with weapons that have increased range, increased accuracy, and were quite deadly. And they're quite deadly in the hands of Green Mountain Boys, 
who used them to very good effect to win American freedom in 1775 and to free the slave and restore the Union during the Civil War. Thank you. <clears throat> What's that, sir? The firing rate for the breech loader. Yes, uh, f the firing rate on the burn side. Uh, you could probably fire six to seven rounds a minute with this very rapidly. Now, keep in mind, you're limited to the amount of ammunition you can carry. Now, a cavalryman has it a little better. He's going to have some ammunition on his horse. But his cartridge box is only going to still hold about 40 rounds. Um, give you an example. On uh, June 17th, 1863, at the Battle of Middleburg, Virginia, the 1st Rhode Island Cavalry is armed with these. They managed to keep the Confederates back for about 45 minutes. Each man had about 80 rounds of ammunition. Um, they were told to fire very deliberately, very slowly. But once that 45 minutes was over, the Confederates came right in and pretty much annihilated the, the regiment. You said that breech-loading uh, weapon, uh, the cartridge, was waterproof? Yes. Uh, you, uh, how, how did the fire get through to the cartridge? Yes, there was a wax. Do you see the uh, small hole on the breech okay. on the bottom of this? This was uh, waxed over, and the, the spark from the percussion cap would supposedly melt through the wax. Sometimes the, sometimes the caps were not that great, and they would misfire. So theoretically, it's wax, it's waterproof. It depends if you have a good percussion cap creating a hot enough uh, spark okay. on that. Yes, sir. Sir. I've been led to believe during the wars that the women at home would make these paper cartridges and send them onto the field. So down, so you the yes, uh, would women uh, make paper cartridges? Absolutely, but they would do them at government, government arsenal facilities. Um, women, women and children were felt with their smaller hands, they could better manufacture the paper cartridges. Um, so women would be employed at the Waterville Arsenal in Albany, um, Richmond Arsenal down in uh, Virginia. Uh, there were several explosions during the war. Um, there was one in Pittsburgh at the arsenal out there, uh, and a number of women were killed while uh, manufacturing uh, these cartridges. Yes, sir. Now, you, 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 you were talking about the mechanism and all that other uh, stuff in the factories. Now, on a, on a gun like that, the, um, all the parts are still interchangeable, or, or they... You, you can only get them uh, at the factory. Uh, was interchangeability continued during the Civil War? Uh, absolutely. Um, by, 18, by the late 1840s, everything, everything, even the privately made weapons like the Burnside, the Sharps, the Spencer, these are all being made with interchangeable parts. So there are various models of these guns. For example, the Burnside, this is a fifth model. You might not get a part from a fourth model to fit it just right. It might take some filing, some some tweaking, but generally it would fit. Um, this is a Providence. This is a Providence tool musket. I could take a screw off of a gun, say manufactured in uh, Chicopee, Mass, at one of the armories there, and it should fit. So interchangeability uh, continued throughout the war. And uh, to really learn more about that, the American Precision Museum down in Windsor. It's open um, in the summer months. Absolutely fantastic exhibits um, to show you about interchangeability. Um, that that process was really you know patented here in Vermont. Um, the Vermonters manufactured so many of these machines that were used really throughout the world. Um, you know, and it's it's really some great stuff they have down there in Windsor. Yes, sir. Why don't you talk more about Windsor when they started up and went into business? Well, I, I, uh, when did Windsor go into business? Uh, well, I wouldn't call myself an expert on, uh, on that, sir, but um, uh, Lampson, Goodnow, and Yale um, start, I believe, there in the 1830s. Um, they start manufacturing um, weapons. Um, they make a uh, what's called a Windsor musket, which is sort of a version of the pattern 1841, and those are manufactured until about 1853. And... 
Nobody really knows what to do with these Windsor Pattern muskets. They put them in arsenals in Maine and New Hampshire, and they're issued to New Hampshire troops a lot during the Civil War. But uh, what Lamps and Goodenow and Yale really do during the Civil War is making that making those machines. Um, they do make 50,000 rifles for the Union in Windsor, Vermont during the Civil War, but it's, it's the machines that are the primary thing that they're turning out at Windsor. And those machines are bought up by Springfield, by Providence Tool, by Amiskeeg, and that's what's uh, used primarily is the machinery. Essentially the birth of the machine tool industry. Exactly, yes sir. Yes. Yep, uh, it's called the uh, Precision Valley through Springfield, Windsor. Um, there, there's, still, there's still some tool manufacturing going down there today. Um, there's a nice little diner across the street. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Uh, yes, ma'am. I have a question about that um, technology of the rifling of the barrel. Yes. In that it imparts spin, and and that increases the range. Yes. Does no. it also increase no. the speed that it comes out of the gun, or does it increase the accuracy? It's accuracy. It's right. accuracy. The reason the reason the range increases is because the cone expands. The more the gunpowder stays behind the bullet. Yeah, more, more muzzle velocity coming out. And I will take uh, one more question uh, from the floor, and then I invite anybody to uh, come up to uh, look at both uh, my weapons and uh, the, the other weapons that were brought today. I have a question. Yes, sir. This is somewhat of a political question. You may choose on that. <laughs> at the time of the, um, the adoption of the 10 amendments, to the Constitution, the first ten. Yes. What do you think the founders thought would be the weapons of a hundred years after? Did they ever imagine the kinds of weaponry that were used in the Civil War? What What, what did the founders think of when they wrote the ten, the Second Amendment? That's a, that's a political football I don't want to touch. Um, <laughs> personally. Personally, I don't like modern weapons. I, I like I look at something like this. This I look at something like the uh, the Burnside. You know, this to me is a thing of beauty. This is this is this is really you know a, a work of art. And you do see guns at some art museums, and you know you can you can trace the history of this. Some young cavalryman from New Jersey was riding around the Shenandoah Valley with this in 1864, and for me as a historian. You know that's where the, the the history of these lie. What what they're done with is important, but you know what they are is is even more important. So thank you. Thank you. If you have more questions or comments for Rob, uh, we're not going to let him leave. So <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely come up and speak with him. Also, please do take your time. Come up, look at some of the. Uh, the weapons and other accoutrement on display, they're here, ask questions. Like I said, Rob will do his best to answer, and if he doesn't know, he'll make something up. <laughs> um, uh, just a little bit of um, housekeeping. Next month's third Sunday lecture is on February the 16th, and it's a poetry reading. And it's a poetry reading of poetry that came out around 2009 in celebration of the quad. Oh, look at that, there it is right there. It's almost as if I timed it that way. And so that will be 2 p.m. here. The author will be uh, reading the poetry. And then again in March, it is the 250th anniversary of the Boston Massacre. Uh, so we are going to be having a speaker come in and present on the Boston Massacre. If you haven't joined our email list, and want to keep apprised of everything. There are sign-up sheets by the, the front door. There are also, um, you can get access through our website, our social media accounts. There's quite a bit always going on. Um, and um, again, we'd like to thank our sponsors who are listed over there for their support to keep these lectures free and keep the lecturers coming in. So thank you very much. And uh, please don't rush out, ask lots of questions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>